well, first of all, uh, thank you, Mike, for the invitation to, um, to be here. And, and um, I, I just want to actually pick up more or less exactly where Naki uh, finished and talk, make a, just a few comments about energy innovation. Um, I think we all recognize that if we're going to have any chance of solving these enormously challenging climate problems, it's going to be through innovations to bring the cost down of low-cost alternatives to fossil fuel. And uh, I would argue that probably our biggest challenge, certainly in this country, but I think this is a more general issue, uh, is to design a system of institutions, the energy innovation system, that has uh, much more, that is much more effective at mobilizing uh, America's innovation resources toward the goal of cost reduction of low carbon uh, uh, technologies than the one we have today. Now, of course, there's no uh, silver bullet. We'll need wind and solar and geothermal and carbon capture and storage uh, and electricity storage and a great deal uh, a huge amount, of course, of energy efficiency measures, but I've been asked to talk specifically about uh, uh, nuclear. So let me say uh, a couple of points about that. But maybe before I do, uh, you know, we, we, those of us who work in these areas get very familiar with these uh, charts, and lines on a chart don't always capture the real scale of, uh, uh, of the challenge. And so, let me, um, you, many of you have probably seen this chart. This is every, sm each small square on that chart is 10 million tons of, per year of uh, carbon dioxide. And there's 726 uh, little squares on that chart. Uh, even for the, the three degree scenario, which most people would consider inadequate, uh, we in the U.S., if we set our goals the same as everybody else's, which many would also say is an inadequate uh, uh, task, but even for the three-degree scenario where you have the sort of weakest view of uh, global equity, we would have to remove 70% of those squares. Uh, and we would have to do it, as someone said, uh, our chairman said, I think, in, in, in his opening remarks, we'd have to do it over, uh, this is, I should say, uh, by the year 2050, uh, a period during which we can expect even our economy to double in size, assuming a relatively modest 2% per capita growth rate uh, between now and then. So it's a, you know, this is, we have to think about the scale. Here's another uh, a view of scale. Uh, Let's just imagine, do a thought experiment, all of the coal we consume uh, in the United States today in a single year in our coal-fired power plants, which account these days for about 35, a little over 30, maybe 37 percent of our electricity. If we put all that coal on a single train, and that train went to all of the f several hundred coal-fired power plants to deliver the coal, that those plants need during the course of the year, that train would be 83,000 miles long. And in order even to achieve the 70% reduction goal by 2050, effectively we have to reduce, eliminate that 83,000 mile coal train. That's the, that's the scale of the task. Now, you know, people are very optimistic, of course, about natural gas and uh, by the way, if all of that coal were to be replaced by natural gas, total emissions would decline in the U.S. by about 20 percent. That's a very significant decline, but of course not even a third of what would be needed even in this less aggressive scenario of uh, 70 percent reduction by mid-century. So my question is, can we do this without nuclear? Well, we can't prove uh, in a mathematical sense uh, the answer to that question, but I think it is a matter of basic common sense that when you have a very difficult task like this, the more options that are available, 
the more likely you are to succeed. And if any option is taken off the table, the chances of failing will increase. And this is especially true uh, in the uh, case of, uh, in, in, in this case, because no two low carbon options are alike. Solar, wind, geothermal, and nuclear, and others, each have their own strengths and weaknesses. And given the enormously varied uh, uh, nature of the energy sy system and the certainty that there will be surprises over the next few decades. Just think of the surprises we've had over the last five years. We will have surprises in energy, and that adds to the uh, value of diversity in our energy uh, portfolio. Now, the, uh, I there's a, I think probably many of us in the room are familiar with the debate about nuclear, the advantages and disadvantages, and it's all been very extensively discussed. Uh, here, I just want to mention a couple of aspects that I think may not be fully appreciated even now, uh, despite the extensive debate on these issues. One is the extreme compactness of uh, nuclear uh, systems. For example, that same thought experiment that produced the 83,000 mile long coal train um, uh, would yield a one mile long nuclear train. That's the amount of space on a train delivering nuclear fuel that would be required to fuel our 100 nuclear power plants generating about 20% of the country's electricity in the course of a year. Uh, the second aspect uh, is the ability of nuclear programs uh, to scale up quickly. Now, this whole debate is about rapid scale up of low carbon uh, energy. If we can't scale up rapidly, we're not gonna come close to uh, achieving these goals. Um, we want rapid scale up in solar and wind and, uh, and all of the other low carbon uh, sources. In fact, historically, and this may come as a surprise, it actually came as a bit of a surprise to me. Um, the, let me just skip to this chart. Historically, um, the, it's nuclear energy that has been by far the most rapid, rapidly scaling low carbon uh, energy uh, uh, source. Um, this shows the amount of uh, carbon mitigation uh, that was achieved in countries like Sweden and France and Belgium uh, during the peak decades of nuclear installation in the 1970s and 80s, a time when nobody was actually talking, or very few people were talking about low carbon uh, or carbon mitigation. But actually, during that period, the uh, rate of addition of low carbon, in this case kilowatt hours of electricity, per capita, because that's the key metric here, low carbon electricity per capita, uh, that, that it was far more rapid uh, than uh, we've been able to achieve in even top of the table renewable countries uh, like uh, Denmark and, 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 and Spain uh, in the last decade or so with their very aggressive uh, deployment of solar and wind. And in Germany, which of course is now phasing out its nuclear plants, uh, low carbon kilowatt hours were added when those plants were being phased in twice as fast as has resulted from the heavy German investment in wind and solar over the last decade. Of course, that's all in the past, and perhaps the pace of solar and wind deployment will accelerate in the future. We hope it will, and certainly the cost reductions uh, that we've seen will suggest uh, uh, so do suggest some acceleration, although it's worth noting that the very aggressive subsidy policies that have driven uh, uh, renewables growth in, in countries like Germany and Spain probably aren't sustainable and may in fact have uh, run their course. Okay. Um, so if nuclear is to play a significant role beyond its current contribution to low carbon or carbon mitigation, uh, the magnitude of this climate challenge is such that the global nuclear contribution would probably need to increase by a factor of two or three by mid-century if nuclear is to play more than a rather minor role 
uh, in future climate mitigation efforts. It's true that there are ambitious plans for nuclear expansion in some countries, China uh, most notably, but if you add up all those plans that countries say that they're going to do with nuclear and also account for the expected retirement of much of the existing nuclear plant fleet because they're getting old and will soon reach or at some point will reach their end of life, the actual nuclear role uh, in carbon mitigation under current plans, business, if you like, business as usual, uh, is likely to grow only pretty slowly uh, during the coming decades and may even uh, start to decline. So how to close the gap between needs and plans? Uh, well, um, innovation. Innovation. Uh, probably most importantly, um, innovation in governance to ensure broad adherence to the principles of safe and, and secure nuclear operations, which were so clearly not present uh, in, in Japan, and to reassure the public that nuclear energy can be used uh, uh, safely. Innovations in people, that's education and training to provide the capabilities uh, for expansion in this area, but also very likely uh, innovations in technology. And here I just want to close by mentioning a few uh, elements of a strategy for nuclear uh, innovation. One uh, will involve placing more reliance on passive safety mechanisms in nuclear plant design. The new generation of light water reactors has moved uh, in this direction, but more advanced designs go much further toward the uh, goal of walk-away safety. It doesn't seem too far-fetched uh, to speculate that that goal, walk-away safety, will become a requirement for all nuclear power reactors 30 or 50 years from now. Another key goal uh, is to reduce nuclear cycle times, which have become almost pathologically long in the U.S. and elsewhere, and which are adding cost and reducing flexibility uh, and exposing investors to greater risk. Certainly, progress will require regulatory uh, reform, but there are also opportunities for technologically driven cycle time reductions. For example, dramatic improvements in uh, modeling and simulation capabilities, new construction methods promising to shorten project lead times, Small modular reactors, we've heard a lot about those, whose hoped-for benefits also include uh, reductions in capital at risk, faster learning cycles, and better matching with uh, small power grids. The grids themselves are on the verge of dramatic change over the next two decades. We are likely to see changes in the electric power grid in this country and other countries that are more far-reaching than anything we have seen over the last several decades. And the challenge for nuclear and other uh, generating technologies is to work out how to meet rapidly varying electrical loads uh, affordably and reliably with hybrid, low-carbon power systems consisting mainly of dispatchable nuclear and non-dispatchable uh, 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 renewables. And there are some very interesting ideas here about hybrid uh, nuclear uh, technologies that we can perhaps discuss in, uh, later. Maybe we'll see other possibilities. For example, lifetime fueling of reactor cores, the so-called nuclear battery concept, uh, and integrated power plant waste disposal systems with spent fuel never actually leaving the boundary of the nuclear power plants but disposed of directly in modular deep boreholes several miles below the Earth's surface in the stable dry bedrock that under, underlies uh, uh, most uh, large areas of most countries. Advances in computational power, new tools for material synthesis, may one day make it possible to design and build radiation-resistant materials from the ground up, atom by atom, and create ultra-secure nuclear waste materials with lifetimes of tens of thousands of years. 
Now, we can imagine all of these things today. By the way, there are many other things that we can't imagine that on a several decade time scale uh, we may, or some of the younger ones of you may see. Um, but nobody knows which of these will uh, actually emerge. The one thing we do know, the one thing we do know is the nuclear power plants of the year 2100 will bear about as much similarity to the workhorse light water reactors of today as my car bears similarity to a 1914 uh, Model T Ford. Uh, and the final point I want to make is that the leaders of these innovations, and I've just really scratched the surface, they aren't going to be people like me. They're going to be uh, the outstanding young engineers and scientists who are today populating, despite the uh, events of the last few years, today populating nuclear engineering programs around this country in growing numbers. Thirty years ago, after Three Mile Island, after Chernobyl, many of the smartest nuclear engineers left the field, and a lot more chose not to enter it. And that was, of course, because of the uncertain outlook for the nuclear industry at the time, but it was also because the industry itself became very cautious and inward-looking and very reluctant to change. And for a dynamic young engineer, that didn't seem like the future. But today, as I look at the young nuclear engineers in my department at MIT and elsewhere, it feels like a somewhat different time. These people, these young people, understand that without nuclear, we're probably cooked, almost literally. They want to do something about climate change, and they see nuclear as one part of the solution. And they see great engineering challenges in designing new nuclear power systems that are safer than today's technologies and that are also economically competitive and that deliver waste and security benefits too. And they're willing to invest the serious time and effort needed to learn and master the new technologies. They understand that this isn't, this isn't innovating through iPhone apps. They understand that this is a multi-year, uh, many-decade investment in many cases. And in some cases, they're willing to take the entrepreneurial risks needed to reduce these technologies to practice. So I, um, uh, let me finish just by observing that the pundits the pundits at the uh, Economist and others uh, like to make snappy pronouncements about nuclear energy. And unfortunately, um, my, the slide that I had showing that many of you, some of you may remember the cover of The Economist that said, nuclear energy, the dream that failed. Well, the thought I'd like to... I, the, the thought I'd like to leave you with is that below the radar, in fact, there's more new thinking and ferment in the nuclear field than I've seen in a very long time, and that the era of nuclear innovation may actually just be getting started. So, thank you.